Next month's series, uh, we're going to deal with the word ask. Ask. A-S-K, ask. We have a whole series, how to ask God, why don't you ask God, asking in faith. You know, just a whole series about not just praying. I heard Miles Monroe say this. He says, the reason prayer services are not attended like regular service is that people really don't believe that they'll get what they pray for. He said, people really don't believe it. He said, if people really believe that they would receive what they ask God for, they would attend the prayer services in droves. But God wants us to ask, say, God wants me to ask, and, and, he wants, and he wants to answer my prayer. He wants to answer your prayer. And you have not because you ask not. And so we're going to go through the whole criteria of asking how to ask, the conditions of asking. And, and don't get caught up in all with condemnation. I don't deserve it. There were people who came to Jesus who did not have a revelation of who Jesus was that asked him to do something. Some called him master. Some called him teacher. They didn't even know he was Christ. And Christ still answered their prayer. So, and it's interesting. Sister Renee came to us this morning when we got, when we, we were walking through. And she said, I want to show you something. She says, someone gave me this book this week, well, just a couple of days ago, right? And, and, and look at it. It says, Ask God. And we have been announcing this series. And this is available on, at, uh, you know, where y'all shop, Amazon. Everybody here, if we had a deliverance service, we could cast out the spirit of Amazon. I think all you would manifest. It'd be, cool. <laughs> Amazon demon, come on. <laughs> I'm still in, I guess I'm still in vacation mode. I'm going to get to the text. But anyway, order this because you can list the things that you're asking God for, and then you can record when you receive them. We should ask with expectation. Tell somebody, you should ask with expectation. Amen. You don't just ask, Lord, I hope I'm worthy. You should ask with expectation. Hey, Elder, let me give you this so I can clear off this a little bit. So get that for the series. This Wednesday, we've been fasting every Wednesday. We've been fasting every Wednesday. Yeah. This Wednesday is our liquid only all day. And we're going to have, we're going to come here together for corporate prayer this Wednesday. At 7 o'clock, it's going to be powerful. I just, I just can't wait. And listen, uh, you, can have, uh, you can have liquids. You can have juice, uh, just, you know, liquids. You can have broth, no chicken, <laughs> broth. And then so that you, so that I don't want you guys staying up to 1201 and eating heavy. Dr. Sam did a wonderful teaching on fasting. We don't want you staying up and eating heavy. After the prayer. After the prayer, after the prayer, you can have some fruit or a salad. No meat, only fruit or vegetable. No rice, no stir fry. Because I don't want you, because after fasting all day, I don't want you to just hurt your bodies or go to bed hungry because, and it may disrupt your sleep. Okay? So after the prayer, now when we're, we're going to meet together at prayer at 7 o'clock, and then we're going to pray. And then after that prayer. I don't know when that prayer is going to end, but when it's over. Amen? All right. All right. God bless you all. Repeat this with me. Thank God for all our guests today. Let's give our guests a hand. Let's do our declaration. Say, Father. I thank you for the word as I receive, meditate, and obey your word, I become the word. Then I can do what the word says I can do. I can have what the word says I can have. The power of your word 
impacts my family for 1,000 generations. And just, just continue to flow and just bring it down just a touch. Here's, let me give you the context of 1 Kings 19, the end of 1 Kings 18, where the, the prophet Elijah is God, you know, prophets in the Old Testament were God's prosecuting attorneys. They would encourage the nation of Israel to righteousness and give the king's direction and what God was saying. But when Israel would get out of pocket, get into sin, prophets would come and give them and remind the nation of the law of the Lord, saying return to God because God has already set his covenant with you and he has already established blessing for obedience and cursing for disobedience. It's already written. So the prophets would come and they would say, return Israel, return Zion. Change your ways. You've gotten off track. You've forgotten the God that delivered you from Egypt. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Sometimes we get off track. I said, sometimes we get off track. We need a prophet to remind us that we're off track. Some, we, we, we get spoiled in the church. We only want good prophetic words to tell us how good we are, how great we are, how good looking we are, and how we're going to be rich and famous. Sometimes you need to get in the prophetic line and a prophet needs to tell you you need to repent and get off that internet. Amen. And stop sleeping around. The line would be empty. The first word, everybody take the seat. You need to treat your husband right. You need to treat your wife better. You need to handle your finances. You're too much in debt. You need to stop lying on your taxes. You need to walk in integrity. Hey, you need to walk in forgiveness. That was, see, that was some good words right there. Because if God cares enough to reveal my shortcomings, then he wants to do something in my life. There's a future for me. Because God is bringing my shortcomings to the light. Don't, don't hide in the dark with your sin, you and your sin in the shadows. Tell God to shine the light on your sin. And that's what prophets would do in the Old Testament. Elijah was one of the most renowned ones of the Old Testament. Man, he'd walk up in the temple uninvited. In the palace. And you didn't go up in the king's palace. He'll have your head. Him, Ahad, and his evil white wife Jezebel. I like that Kanye song about Jezebel doesn't even stand a chance. Some of y'all don't know that anyway. Here goes Elijah. He walks up in the temple. He said, there'll be no rain according to my word. You guys are sinning. God setting up the heavens. Remember, open heaven is a sign of God's blessing. His blessing comes down. A closed heaven is a sign of of, 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 of sin and God's judgment, just like in the days of Samuel where the heavens were closed and there was no open dream, there was no revelation, there was no prophetic word because the heavens were closed. And they had said there would be no rain. And then he walked out. I mean, we need some people like that today. Go tell the mayor of Detroit. Go tell somebody. You don't know me, but here's a word for you. And Elijah was known as a man who troubled Israel. And as we, in the 18th chapter, they have Ahad and Jezebel, she, they had their own prophets, prophets of Baal, because they got entitled worship. In the 18th chapter, there's a showdown. A lot of us know this, but there's a showdown between the prophets of Baal and the God of Israel. 
400 prophets come together. And they're doing all kind of stuff. Having a competition. We're going to build an altar. And the God that answers by fire, he's God. And say, Elijah said, you go first. You the home team. You go first. Amen. They go, 400 of them do them. They cut themselves and do all that. I'm not serving a God where I got to cut myself, hurt myself. I'm not trying to hurt myself. I mean, I, I get persecuted for righteousness, but I'm not going to be cutting and bleeding. And Elijah, he's sitting back and he's just mocking them. He's talking about them. He's just making fun of them because nothing's happening. And eventually, they get tired. Here come Elijah. He brings through the stones, the 12 stones, you know, the stones of Israel representing the nation. And he pours water on the sacrifice. Amen. Saying, you know, not only will God uh, have to answer by fire, but he has to dissolve the water because it's hard to set something on fire that's already wet. And he pours the altar and he answers to God and said, God, answer this prayer and show the nation that you're calling them back. Sometimes when God answers your prayer, it's not because you're living a perfect life. Sometimes his goodness comes to you so that you repent. Sometimes he answers your prayer so he lets you know that he wants you to come back. He wants you to return. Somebody say return. Man, that word keeps just bubbling. Return. So, so the people, the God, he, he prays that prayer and the fire comes from heaven and it it just, it, it just laps up the water. It burns the sacrifice. And Elijah commands the people in that moment, kill these prophets of Baal. Kill them. Not figuratively kill them. Literally kill them. They kill them. And Elijah, he sees a hand, and I'm going to speed up the story, but he sees and. After all these, these, all this time of drought and famine, God shows him a hand and he lets him know that the rain is coming. From a small cloud, an abundance of rain. From a small cloud, big things come in small packages. Big answers come by small faith. A seed, faith as a seed, a mustard seed can move mountains. So a small cloud comes. Brings rain. He tells Ahad, you better get your chariots out of here because you're going to get stuck in mud because rain is on the way. All of this happening. Word gets back to Jezebel. You know, we talk about Jezebel a lot, but Jezebel's spirit is not a, a female spirit. It is a spirit. Men can be Jezebels just like women can be Jezebels. Let me just help you all out there. Amen. Don't be calling your wife a Jezebel. And don't call your husbands an Ahad. You know, real cussing Christian homes. We just call each other biblical names. You a Jezebel. You an Ahad. But in this instance, Jezebel was dominant. I mean, she had Nabal killed, and we won't go into all that. But Jezebel was a hot mess. They said that. Ahab went and told her, we lost a competition. They killed the prophets. The rain came. Elijah is shining. He's trending on Instagram. All that he did. She sends word to him and says, I'm, by tomorrow, my name ain't Jezebel if I don't kill you. After all this, what God did, all what God did, and this shows us that humanity you could be used of God to call fire from heaven, but you're still in your flesh and blood. Amen. And Elijah got the word, and he, man, he took off running. I mean, he, he was like, this woman is going to kill me. And he went hiding. And he's, he's depressed. He is he, mentally, emotionally, he is depressed. He's under a tree. He won't even eat. He's lost his appetite. He is suffering mentally. And God sends an angel and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I'm tired of this. 
I'm through with this. I'm over this. It's good that God sees us sometimes. You know, he sees our humanity when we get tired. He says, he says take something to eat. And, and, and Elijah is, is strengthened a little bit, and he goes a little further. Angel comes again and says, Elijah, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the only one that's, I'm the only one. And I've gone through this and this woman trying to kill me. Nobody's standing for God except me. Sometimes, don't you ever feel like you're the only one, you know, I'm the only one going through this. I'm the only one faced with this. I'm the only one experienced this. My marriage is the only one going through this. My relationship, my family is the only one going through this. And God says, listen, listen. This is what I want you to do. Get up and go announce, go anoint some people for me. Go announce, anoint, anoint Hazel, King of Aram, anoint Jehu, and anoint Elisha to replace you. And by the way, Elijah, I got 7,000 more prophets that haven't bowed. I'm never, God says, I'm never without a witness. I'm never without people who are standing for truth. I'm never without a prophet or remnant. I always got voices. Now, you know, sometimes when I read these scriptures, I ask myself the question, I ask my question, like, how in the world is Elijah, how, why does he feel? How does he feel when, when God says, I want you to anoint your replacement? Is it like a punishment? But then as I look at it, I don't think it's a punishment. Because God has given Elijah in the, in, in, in the uh, upcoming chapters, God has given Elijah a tremendous reward. He is about to be caught up in the chariot. I think it's a principle that we miss in the church. That we should always be looking to anoint our Elishas. That we should always be looking to hand off the mantle to someone else. You can't be 92 years old, still on the dance team. Put down the flags. It's over. It's over. Anoint somebody else. You could be of good health. You could be vital, I mean, full of vitality and energy. But if you're 92, <laughs> and you pull a hamstring or something, you just, everything stops you. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Have oh, mercy. Let me say, let them, don't let the pastor go on vacation. Don't let him go. <laughs> you got to look for your Elisha. Always. I'm looking for my Elisha. You think I'm going to be standing up here? You know how, you, you see how I get off subject now. I'm standing up here at 70. You don't want to be in this church. I'm up here at 70 years old. I'm going to let it all rip. I ain't going to hold back nothing. They're going to be like, oh, let, let's get this whole. And it's amazing. Pastors will hold on to a church. People leaving. Nobody's there. It's a senior citizen. An AARP meeting. There's no young people in the church. And the church will dry up. And there's three people left. And they call it a church. It's a senior meeting. It's not a church. Because nobody will look for their Elisha. Always look for your Elisha. Come on, somebody say, always look for your Elisha. I go to these countries. I'm looking for a retirement place. You think I'm going to be sitting up here preaching to I fall out you? Uh, the devil is a liar. Amen. We're looking at Barcelona next. Possibly. If I find me a home, I'm going I'm, to I'm retire where I can still ride me a bike and still chase my wife around. I ain't going to be in a wheelchair. Wait up, baby. I'm trying to. 
Say so, two legs. <laughs> Let me go. Lord God Almighty. Whew. So here comes Elijah. He anoints the kings. We pick up at 1 Kings 19 through 21. So Elijah went from there and he found Elisha, son of Saphat, and he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And he himself was driving the 12th pair. So you got six sets of oxen, six pairs. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak on him, around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. And then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? Verse 21, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. And he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Oh, everything else I said was preliminary. This here is the prophetic word. It is interesting that God picked this set of circumstances for Elijah and Elisha to meet. Elisha's doing what he's done probably for years. His family's farm, his family's land. And they had acres of land because they had six pair of oxen. And an oxen could do acres of land. He, the ox could work at about five, uh, five hour cycles. So they had to have a lot of land to have this many ox. They had to be a family of means. But in this encounter, Elijah, Elisha is plowing. Elijah comes and, and anoints him and, 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 and puts the mantle. In other words, God has selected you for something. God has chosen you for something. I'm putting my mantle on you. There is something God wants to do in your life. This is a visible sign of what God is doing in you spiritually. You know, you, you, when you, you were anointed, you're not, you're not just called to sit here. You're, you're called for something. You're called for, for something great, something impactful. So he places a mantle on Elisha. Elisha is plowing. He's doing what he's known to do. He's doing what he's used to doing. But now an opportunity has come for Elisha to turn the corner and do something else. And he has to make a choice. Do I do what I've been doing and stay behind the ox? Or do I give this up? That which is familiar and that which I've been doing. That which even has yielded a certain degree of fruitfulness because he's planting and he's harvesting and he's getting some return. And, you know, you could be you could be moderately successful or you could be successful. I, I, I hear the story of Todd Delaney, how he was a baseball player and he gave up baseball his whole career to sing worship. And, 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 and so you could be doing something, a year of fruit, but when the mantle comes, it demands a response. I said, when the mantle comes, it demands a response. When the call comes, it demands a response. And at that moment, you have to decide, do I stay behind the ox? Or do I follow the prophet? So many, so many times people get the call or the prophetic word about anointing and they go start a ministry. No, his next job was not to minister, not to start a church, not to grab a title, but his call was a call to serve. Because the mantle increases over your life through service. That's how you become comfortable with what God has placed on you. That's how you begin, it gets tailored to you because you get used to it. I think about us and, and everything we've done. We've served, we've been married 38 years. We've served in the church since day one of our marriage, even before our marriage. We, see what Gail was singing in the choir? I was a minister, 16 years old. We didn't start a church till eight years ago. Everything we do in the church is a pattern and, and comes from years of service. People don't want to serve now. They just want a title. 
Do I stay behind the ox? And that ox, you have to point. You have to say what the ox is. I can't point. You, you, everybody's got a different ox. Well, there's fear. There's complacency. Or it's just, just stuck. Procrastination. Whatever it is. At the time of the mantle, at the time of the call, you have to make a decision. Do I stay behind the ox? Or do I leave this and embark upon something new that I haven't done before? Sometimes we try to keep the ox and the mantle. You can't have both. Come on, tell somebody you can't have both. You can't have both. This, this, this message God dropped, to, dropped on me in Greece when, when, because a few weeks ago, God said, I command you, Jen to Jen, to turn the corner. So now we got to make a decision. We got to make a decision. Do we stay behind the ox? Or do we embark upon a new journey? That's the first thing. Second thing is Elisha understands what it means to be yoked. Because the Bible says he's plowing with a pair of ox, which means the two ox are yoked together. One yoke pulling the plow. One yoke pulling the plow. So Elisha would understand what it means to serve Elijah because he has seen two ox yoked together, working together. But you know what I found out? Every ox won't be yoked. Some oxes refuse to be yoked. And you can put a yoke on them. They ain't trying to do that. Those oxes end up in the slaughterhouse. It's kind of similar to the tree. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, God cuts it off. Now, there's a couple of lessons in this. First, be careful who you yoke to. Why are you going to yoke up with somebody don't even believe, ain't going where you going, ain't believing how you believing? You yoked up with somebody, he pulling or she pulling or they pulling one way, you pulling another. You're not getting anything done. But they love me. <sighs> but she ain't going nowhere. God has place a mantle on your life, an anointing on your life, and here you go keep yoking up to that old going nowhere group of people or individual. But Elisha understood what it means to be yoked. Tell somebody, be careful who you yoke up with. That's the one lesson. The other lesson is that this yoke is not, is not foreign because even to us as Christians, because Jesus says it. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and the burden you have to carry is light. We have too many Christians in the church that won't even submit to the yoke of Jesus. That's why you can't get people committed nowadays. They don't take the yoke. You can't get people to serve because they won't wear the yoke. You can't get people to obey the word of God over their emotion and over their appetites and over their personal desires because they won't wear the yoke. They're like an ox that resists the yoke. We need a prophetic word. See, that's, that's a good prophetic word. So y'all should, should be running right around the church on that one. Don't want to wear the yoke. Don't want to wear the burden of Christ. Don't want to wear the obedience to Jesus. Won't wear the yoke. Elisha made a decision. 
Elijah hit him with that mantle. And Elisha said, my life has changed. When Jesus came into your life, you ought to say, my life has changed. My direction has changed. My focus has changed. My appetite has changed. My, 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 my whole reason for being has changed. I'm going to take this yoke off. He leaves the ox and he goes after Elijah and he tells Elijah this. He says, he asks him a question. He said, let me go back and tell my family. Let me tell my family, just say goodbye to them. And Elijah says something to Elisha that I just, I wrestled with. I was like, what does this mean? He tells him, he says, go back. Elijah replied, what have I done to you? And I said, what does that mean? Go back. What have I done for you? And what have I done to you? And at first, I thought it was Elijah saying to Elisha, what have I done for you by giving you this mantle? You don't know the trouble you're going to face, and you don't know the opposition you're going to face. What have I done to you? Which is true because every yoke and every anointing, every mantle comes with a level of responsibility. It, it demands a response. Amen? But then as I read it and I started looking at other translations, amen, the translations actually say, go, don't forget what just happened. Don't forget what happened to you. Go back, but don't forget what happened or what I've done to you or what I've done for you. This is important because when you are ready to embark on something and you're about to take, make a shift and you're about to make a change and, and, and you're about to do something that's not popular, people will probably try to talk you out of it. And people will tell you that it doesn't take that. And you need to remember the place of the mantle. You need to remember the word of the Lord so that when you go back, you don't forget. You don't forget because you know what will happen? You will compromise because you will say, I don't want to sacrifice this much. Elijah tells Elisha, go back. Don't forget what I've done for you. This moment, that call, that word. That prophetic word, that dream, that vision, don't forget. Somebody say, don't forget. Come on, somebody else say, don't forget. Because if you forget, you're going to compromise. Elisha goes back, he tells his family, and then he does something that is most severe. Amen. I, I don't know if it caused a problem or not. But he comes back. He's ready to follow Elijah. And Elisha takes the two ox and the yoke. He takes the yoke that's made of wood, breaks it up, sets it on fire, kills the ox, has a barbecue. Now, if I was his daddy, I'd be, I'd be like, listen, boy, these ox is not yours. He has a barbecue and feeds it to the people. You know, the saying is sometimes don't burn bridges. There are some bridges you need to burn. There are some bridges you need to burn. I'm going to say it again. There are some bridges you need to burn. Let me say it to the audience. There are some bridges you need to burn. You need to cook them. You need to break them up. You need to feed them to somebody else. There are some bridges you need to burn. There are some relationships you need to burn. There are some affiliations, some connections. You need to burn that bridge. Well, Lord, couldn't he just kill the ox? And kept the yoke? Or could he just destroy the yoke and 
let the ox go. No, he burned everything. He said, because if I keep the yoke, I can replace it with new ox. And I keep the ox, I can get a new yoke. I'm going to burn both ends. I'm going to burn the north side of the bridge and the south side of the bridge. I'm going to burn it at both ends. You cannot have a new life holding on to the old pieces. You cannot have a new beginning in this season of new beginnings. You cannot have a new beginning holding on to fragments of an old yoke, of an old relationship, of an old ox, of an old habit, of an old mindset, of an old stubborn wheel, of your pride, of your unrepentance. You cannot have a new beginning with the old. Burn, baby, burn. Burn, baby, burn. Burn, baby, burn. Burn, baby, burn. This is a word. Come on, somebody say, this is a word for me. This is a word for me. This is a word for me. But it was good. And it yielded fruit. And it served its purpose. But now the mantle has come. Kill the ox and pick up the mantle. It'll take you further. You think you're going somewhere now? You think you're going somewhere now? If you would kill the ox and destroy the, the anointing, destroy the yoke. Elisha went on to do double the miracles of Elijah. He, he went on to get the double portion. You satisfy, you selling for some single. You selling for something, some residue. You're selling for what your flesh can get. You're selling for what a relationship can give you. You're selling for so much less. If you would kill the ox and pick up the mantle, you would experience double in your life. This is how Jesus said. Jesus said, don't nobody give up. Don't no one give up husband, wife. Nobody gives up anything that doesn't receive what? Sevenfold. Nobody does something for me, Jesus says. Nobody tells their flesh no and is not rewarded. Nobody gives their life and I don't come in and bless them. God said nobody kills their ox and doesn't experience fruitfulness in life. Nobody presents their bodies a living sacrifice whom I don't honor and whom I don't bless. Nobody gives me more than I give them. Nobody gives God more than he brings back to your life. Somebody say, kill the ox and pick up the mantle. Kill the ox and, and pick up the mantle. It's new. I got to learn how to carry this. I got to learn what this does. I got to leave the familiar. 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 No wonder when, when Elisha finally got the mantle, when Elijah got caught up, no wonder he struck the waters and said, where is the God of Elijah? This God that I, this man I've been serving in the miracles I've seen him do and the things I've seen him do now, now I'm left with this and I, I know how to work the plow and I know how to steer the ox, but, but I got this now, so God, show me where, don't you know that if you would kill the ox and pick up the mantle, God would show himself to you? 
that you will not have to wonder where the Lord God of Elijah is. You will not have to fix the circumstances and the issues of your life by yourself. You, because why? Because now you've been yoked up with Christ. Your partner is Christ. The yoke is Jesus. You don't have to figure it out. Just kill the excuses. Kill the fear. Kill the old patterns, the bad patterns, the destructive patterns, and pick up the metal. Regardless how long you've been doing it. Regardless how long and how comfortable it is. There's double in this mantle. There's power in obedience. There's blessing in sacrifice. Whatever that ox is. Whatever that ox is. Whatever the ox is. Maybe it's a pair of ox. It was a pair of ox. Maybe it's a pair of ox. Maybe it's five. Maybe you got some real stuff going on. Maybe you got five ox. It doesn't matter. This just makes the barbecue bigger. You want to turn the corner on some things. You want a fresh start and a new beginning. You've got to kill that ox. And you got to pick up the mantle. You got to go back to what God said. You got to go back to what God told you. You got to go back to that place of anointing where God gave you the dream about your future. That's the mantle. You got to kill whatever has stopped you, hindered you, blocked you, slowed you down, detoured you, disrupted you, divided you, confused you, perplexed you, bound you, trapped you. You got to go back to that. You got to kill it and say no more. You got to unfollow them, unfriend them, block them, delete their number. You got to stop falling for the same trap in a different package. It's just a different package. It's the same demon. It's the same demon. She had an hourglass shape. Now she's shaped like a Coke bottle. It's the same demon. He was 6'3 and dark. Now he's 5'10 and white. It's the same demon. At first it was indulging in drugs. Now it's indulging in something else. It's the same demon. Because what? The devil knows, and your future knows, and devil knows, if you kill that ox, and you get a good grip on that mantle, man, you will trouble Israel. You will trouble your family. You will shake up your future. You will, you will turn a generation. You will, you will amen, bring revival to a region. Man, the enemy knows if you got a hold to the power and the destiny and the will of God upon your life, amen, you will shake the earth. Your writings will shake the earth. Your business will, will bring wealth. Whatever it is, you got a hold of this. That's why the enemy doesn't want you. He doesn't want you to get this. He doesn't want you to get the man. He doesn't want you. He wants to give you ox. He wants to give you excuses. He wants to give you excuses. Glory to God. Because if you get a hold to the mantle, if you get a hold to the mantle, if you get a hold to the mantle, how many are going to take the mantle? Kill the ox. 
Kill the ox, kill the ox, kill the ox, and pick up the mantle. Come on and let's stand. Come on and pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment. Oh! Oh, I hear the Lord saying that I brought you back even through this word to a fork in the road again. It's a familiar place. It's called the place of decision. And those that are here and those that are viewing online, I bring you back to that fork in the road, that place of decision. And the Lord says, well, even in times past, you've chose to continue on your present journey. The Lord says, through my grace, through my mercy, I bring you back again. And the Lord says, make the choice, make the choice to follow obedience, to follow my purpose and my design for your life. And the Lord says, if you would sacrifice your will for my will, the Lord says, you will see such breakthrough and blessing. And yes, it will be a process of dying and it will take the renewing of your mind and the setting of your will. But the Lord says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord says, no longer be yoked to the patterns of old, but come to this place of decision and receive the mantle, the anointing, the gift, the destiny that I've spoken to you even years ago and even decades ago, says the Spirit of the Lord. And the Lord says, I release my mantle upon you, even your home and your family and your generations, the Lord says. Even the difficult cases and the difficult circumstances, the Lord says, I cause my mantle to fall even upon your home, says the Lord. And I even cause deliverance to come to your home. So the Lord says, even the decision you make for yourself, it is not just for yourself, but it is for the future Elishas that will come and that will draw and that will connect to you. And even in your home, your sons and daughters and grandchildren, the Lord says, so step up and receive the mantle. Step up and take the mantle. The Lord says, kill the ox and pick up the mantle says the spirit of the living God. Come on and give Jesus a shout of praise in this place. <laughs> 